Ah, The Fast and the Furious, one of the movie franchises of all time, with nitrous that sends you into warp speed and cars driving on infinite runways. Something which, on paper, will be a great recipe for some action-packed racing games, and yet, every single licensed game that has been released seems to be either a mobile game or something that vaguely resembles something like shovelware. Or is it? Although The Fast and the Furious Crossroads and Showdown may be the two games that come to mind, they were released multiple years after a different game that was released for the PS2 and PSP, which was simply called The Fast and the Furious. But is it just as much of a shovelware game as the ones that came after it? Or is this some kind of underrated gem that no one knows about? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's take a closer look and see if this game is indeed as fast and furious as the movies it was based on. But first, let's figure out how this game even exists in the first place. In 2002, a movie tie-in game based on the first movie was intended to be developed by Genki, who were known for the Tokyo Extreme Racer series, which were pretty well received at the time and have gained quite a bit of a cult following in recent years. So it was no surprise that Universal approached them to make a game based on the original movie and also have some references to the upcoming sequel. And in 2003, a trailer was released during that year's E3 where it was shown that it would take place in Los Angeles, just like the first movie, and according to Genki, over 80 story-driven missions. However, the game was cancelled before it could have been released at the end of that year, which seemed to be related to publisher issues, although the game's apparent unfinished state as shown during E3 may have also been a cause. That didn't particularly mean that Universal was no longer interested in publishing such a game though, as a few years later another developer had a similar idea for a movie tie-in this time basing the game on the third movie, Tokyo Drift. The development would be done by Eutechnics, who, just like Genki, were also very familiar with developing racing games, with their most well-known game at the time being Street Racing Syndicate, a street racing game released in 2004 that tried to compete with racing games like Need for Speed Underground. They tried to beat these games with the usage of, shall we say, interesting visuals. Although it wasn't the smash hit that they hoped for, it gained quite a cult following over the years, just like Genki's racing games, and it's still even purchasable to this day on Steam. So overall, they did have some experience with racing game development, especially when it comes to street racing. So it will be no surprise that many see their next racing game as a spiritual successor to SRS, which was then released in 2006 for the PS2 and in early 2007 on the PSP and, as mentioned before, was simply titled The Fast and the Furious, with Namco being the publisher just like with SRS. It did not officially release for the original Xbox, but Modern Vintage Gamer found an unreleased prototype build of the game on an old development kit from Eutechnics. And my guess is that the Xbox 360's release in late 2005 probably made the game's development for the order console pointless. The release was met with mixed receptions, as the meta score for both versions is just under 60 out of 100 points, and the reviews are anywhere between 4 out of 10s to 7 out of 10s. But you came to this video to figure out what the game's like and why these ratings were given in the first place. So let's start with the game's first impressions. As soon as you boot up the game and get ear blasted by Universal's intro, you are able to enter the single player mode, and as soon as you dive in, you get introduced to the Shuto Expressway network, the entirety being referred to in game as the Wangan. This is the famous Wangan Highway. This is where everybody comes to get their speed kicks. Where you'll be given a car and are tasked with catching up and literally gapping another driver. The car you'll be given actually depends on what version of the game you're playing. If you have a PAL or a European copy, it will be a Toyota Supra, and if you're on NTSC, so an American copy, or on a PSP, it will be the Honda NSX instead. This was actually done because the PAL version does not have any Acura nor Honda cars, and my best guess is that this discrepancy is due to licensing issues. Either way, as soon as you start driving, you can probably notice that the sense of speed is actually really good. Until you activate the Nitrous, where the effect is so insane that it literally feels like the actual movies. Now, since I played this on an emulator, I had a minor bug that the effect was different from how it normally is. But it was actually quite helpful since it kept some good visibility around the center of the screen. On original hardware, or on the emulator's software mode, it looks more like a blurry mess when there's a minor earthquake going on. But we'll talk about the gameplay later, we first have an opponent to beat. Ride. 
After winning your first race, you'll be given $18,000 and get sent to the car dealership to buy yourself your first car. This is where the game already shows its good variety in cars as you have just under 20 different options to choose from, from Hachirokus to Eclipses and cars that even come right up from the factory like a TRD modified MRS. However, the game only features Japanese and American manufacturers. But considering the variety of cars from the brands that are present, this didn't really feel like a big issue when playing the game. Anyway, I decided to go for a Ford Focus SVT 170 as that particular model isn't a common occurrence in other games. And as soon as you get your first car, you actually get thrown straight into the upgrade shop. And yes, this game does have its fair share of Uncle Ben's quality rice, and no, this game will not stop you from racing your first car immediately after you get it. But credit where credit's due, the visual customization in this game is actually really good. With some cars having their fair share of iconic body kits from companies like Veilside and Top Secret. But that's not all. Aside from their usual body kits, neons and massive rear wings, you can also change some obscure parts like pulling LEDs in your rim valve stems or adding a drift trinket to your rear bumper, to even being able to change the look of your pop-up headlights. There's also a paint and livery editor, although the vinyls can sometimes be a bit too pixelated and there's no color picker available. However, considering it's a PS2 and PSP game and the overall levels of customization are really good, I am also not going to complain about this too much. And lastly, there is the performance shop. This is where you'll have your pretty standard range of upgrades, from ECUs and engine upgrades to tire upgrades and gearboxes. However, not all the upgrades should be immediately maxed out. For example, the gearbox upgrades may have long or short ratios, as well as the fact that there are both grip and drift tires, the latter of which will be useful in a set of events I'll talk about later. You can also give these cars quite some power. The Focus I chose as my starter car can easily get over 500 horsepower, with cars like the Corvettes and Skylines being able to reach around 800 when you unlock the best upgrades as the game only gives you stage 4 in the beginning, so you'll have to unlock stage 5 upgrades as you play the game. And last but not least, some cars also feature engine swaps, which can turn cars like the AE86 into absolute racing monsters. So to summarize, the customization in this game is really good and left a great first impression on me. Now, once you're done upgrading or pricing your car, you get thrown onto the Tokyo Expressway network, which serves as the game's open world. The map has a pretty decent size, although the road network is quite sparse, so you'll seek some of the sections quite often. You can simply free roam around the map and enter any location, including hotspots, which are the places where the racing events will take place. These are divided into two disciplines, highway racing, just like what you do in the prologue, and toge racing, which take place on a set of mountain roads. You can enter these by simply driving towards the off-ramp where they are located, or if you're feeling lazy, you can always just teleport towards them. Let's talk about those highway races first, which are exactly what you would expect. High-speed races across Tokyo's famous and infamous highway network. Every race is a duel against a single opponent, and there's two variants. Destination battles, which are simple sprint races, and top speed battles, which are exactly as the name says. Although the layouts start out very simple with only a few turns, they progressively get more difficult, both in terms of track layout, as they also start to include U-turns and off-ramps, and in terms of the speed of the cars you'll be driving. These races will feel familiar if you've played games from the Tokyo Extreme Racer or Wanga Midnight series. But if you enter the Toge races, it will suddenly feel like you're playing Tokyo Extreme Racer Drift instead. These are, just like the name implies, on tight mountain roads, where you'll find two different modes as well. Grip battles, which are again simple sprint races, and drift battles, which are, once again, exactly what it says, in which you score points by pulling some sick skids. But the game actually gives you more points for using more difficult drift styles. For example, a simple power slide may not give as many points as a scandy flick, known in this game as a faint drift. You can then learn about these different drift styles from Dajiro Yoshihara, who is now quite a legend in the drifting scene. Although this is all really cool, it does sometimes cause some frustration when the game misinterprets your drift, and you end up getting next to no points for the otherwise really nice drift you just pulled off. Also, in these races, if your opponent finishes ahead of you, the points you gain will slowly decay, similarly to how it works like most wanted speed trap races. So at this point you've probably decided on what to do, but how does it feel to drive? Well, to put it simply, it's very difficult to describe. On some occasions, it can feel phenomenal. The cars feel like they have quite some weight, but if you can pull them properly through the corners, it can be a very satisfying experience being on the limit of grip. 
On the other hand, however, it can feel like the cars are borderline undrivable, which becomes particularly problematic when the cars start to become really fast. This is then amplified once you enter the drift events. Especially in the beginning, it can feel pretty decent, although it's definitely not the easiest game to drift in. But as soon as you reach the endgame Toke races, which involve faster cars and tighter courses, it can be nearly impossible to pull off any good drifts whatsoever. This problem is somehow amplified when driving a rear-wheel drive car, which can violently snap understeer or oversteer to the point of uncontrollability. And although all cars have this problem to an extent, it's especially problematic on this set of cars. What's even more strange is the fact that all-wheel drive cars and even front-wheel drive cars are much more controllable once you throw them into a drift and keep them in one, which is also not helped by the fact that the tire upgrades are very inconsistent. For example, I tried drifting the Ford Focus I started out with, which, mind you, had grip tires, which allowed me to pull some absolutely ridiculous drifts. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I cannot, I cannot. Oh, god. that was fucking perfect. What's even funnier is that some cars actually become even faster in the corners once you give them high level drift tires. To the point where this Mustang GTR concept I built after completing the game was able to do stuff like this. There are also driving assists in the game, but I did not notice a single difference between turning them on or off, so this didn't seem to help the physics problem either. The wall physics in this game are another problem point. At one moment you can use them to wall right around corners at insane speeds, and at the other, you will either bounce up or get completely stuck in the wall for a few seconds. This can be quite frustrating, especially in the tighter toge stages that you'll find towards the end of the game. And lastly, although the upgrade system is quite intuitive, with the exception of having to be careful with the tires and transmission, the nitrous in this game is completely overpowered. If you want to completely destroy the first few Wangan crews, all you really need is a good nitrous upgrade and you're good to go. Although this does make the usage incredibly satisfying, and grounded it's what the franchise is kind of known for, it does break the early game progression for Wangan races, which is why I also decided to not get any NAS upgrades for my trusty Ford Focus until the races started to become too difficult. Luckily, most cars are still quite manageable with the right set of upgrades. Although I would generally recommend not running your car with too much power, you can also choose between grip and drift tires, as well as shorter or longer transmissions. This does allow you to fine-tune your car a bit, although it's not uncommon to still run into some of the aforementioned problems. A positive point I can mention about the game is the graphics, as they are pretty decent for a PSP slash PS2 game. The sense of speed is also definitely there, and the design of the highway and toge maps is really well done, with one of the first toge races even going past a really pretty looking dam section. Sticking with graphics, one unique feature of this game is related to the heads-up display. Although the game starts you out with a simple but decent analog one, there are actually two more to choose from, which are called the Digital and Cyber Huts. The Digital Hut is a bit similar to the analog one but also gives you some more info, like the car's current power and torque output, which can be really helpful to figure out your car's power band. The Cyber Hut literally gets rid of almost all the dials and gives you even more data, like the G-forces, and also has this strange purple rod which points to the destination you have set which to me looks a bit like a placeholder they forgot to fix rather than an actual part of the HUD. But considering how the HUD itself almost looks like a debug one in itself, it may as well be intentional. Also, although both the digital and analog HUD show that they can go up to 7 gears, I haven't found a single car in the game that actually has that. So if you know which car has 7 gears in this game, feel free to tell me in the comments below. And speaking of cars, the engine sounds are a bit of a mixed bag. Some of them can sound pretty decent, like the Trenno and some V8-powered American cars. And then there are also quite a few pretty bad examples which isn't helped by the fact that many car sounds are reused, like a Charger SRT8 having the exact same engine sound as an Eclipse GT, even if you perform an engine swap. This also extends to the game's soundtrack. 
It may have some of the most generic rock music you will ever hear, but that doesn't mean the songs are bad, and the variety is pretty good. Including some J-pop songs, a song from Cell Dweller, which you can also hear in the intro of the game, and a few tracks specifically composed for the game by Adam Fox. Now let's go back to the game's progression, as you will unlock new upgrades and faster cars over time as you win races at the various hotspots. But if you beat all members of a crew, their leader will appear. They usually give a bigger reward, and upon beating them, they'll give you a so-called friendship sticker, which, if applied to your car, allows you to get discounts on parts, sometimes only in certain tuning shops, which is also the reason why some shops have different names. Also, if it's the first crew you beat at a hotspot, you will unlock the next location too. And since there are 2 crews each and 8 locations in total, you're looking at a respectable 80 races in total. But there's more. When you're just free roaming around the map, you will regularly encounter roll-up racers. If you want to race them, all you have to do is flash your headlights and off you go. They're effectively the same as Underground 2's Outrun races, where you have to be 200 meters in front to win, or by contrast, 200 meters behind to lose. These are actually a really good way to get money in the early parts of the game, and with a fast car, you can basically win these as soon as they begin. However, they also have their fair share of issues, like off-ramps not working properly or moments when the AI goes the wrong way, but the game still thinks you haven't won yet. Either way, they're fine most of the time and are a nice quick pastime when you're driving towards your next destination. Aside from the bugs with the roll-up racers, the game is actually quite well polished too, as I've only encountered things that didn't work properly a few times or when I was specifically trying to look for them, which I think for a game like this is definitely worth a mention. What's also worth a mention is the overall car roster, as you unlock new cars over time and there are a lot of them. There is a great variety of cars, which includes some common ones like the Nissan Skylines and Lancer Evos, but also some more obscure ones, like the EU Spec 2006 Civic and some pretty cool Subaru Imprezas, like the S203 and S204. The game also features a few supercars, from a few Corvettes, and yes, even the C6R, which is the most expensive car in the game, to even a Lexus LFA concept. One problem with the car roster, though, is that there is a strangely inconsistent lack of older cars. As ones like the EK9 Civic, 22B, and any Skyline before the R34 are missing. As well as no Suzuki's, which therefore means there's no Giga Chino, so this game is a guaranteed 0 out of 10 worst game ever. Just kidding. Although cars like the Corvette C6R and Nismo z tune cannot be customized, usually because they already come pre-modified, almost every other car still has the same impressive customizability, with practically every part being from real-life manufacturers, with some cars even having more customization options than games like Juiced and Need for Speed Underground. Now, going back to those hotspots, did I actually mention that each opponent also has their own biography? Well, some of these are... quite interesting. Z. Some call him a natural racer, but Damien was born to MSC, to MSC, oh god. The haters say he talks a lot of noise and has no skills to back it up. As your legs and sheer straight line speed, he more than makes up for his uncanny ability to swoon. <laughs> oh, this guy has more riz, oh god. <laughs> we got a guy with all the riz and no power again. <laughs> his friends call him LB, but thanks to his mad karaoke, carry carry oh my god, more riz. It's more riz. <laughs> Sticking with these opponents as they get faster and the races get more difficult, you'll be able to find some iconic cars and names, like Tanner Faust, Daijiro Yoshihara, Han from Tokyo Drift, and of course the family man Dom Toretto himself, who had a rather fitting crash during my playthrough. Now, the highway part of the game stays pretty fun throughout the entire playthrough, even when the cars become really fast. Although it may be hard to control at this point, if you get the hang of the driving physics, and especially if you get an all-wheel drive car, it can be very satisfying wrangling a high-speed beast along the Tokyo highways. The final crew, Top Secret, is also an iconic name in the tuning scene, who has made some of the fastest tuned machines in the world, with the final event being a race around the entire map, aptly named World Tour, against none other than the founder himself, Kazuhiko Smoky Nagata. Despite this really cool prospect though, the AI seems to still struggle quite a lot in these endgame races, especially since, for some reason, the entire Top Secret crew forgot to install nitrous in their cars. This allowed me to win the race in my trusty Ford Focus, 
with a lead of a whopping 7 minutes. Well, at least you get that Nissan Skyline sedan or Infiniti G35 if you really want to disambiguate them, which is admittedly a really cool and quick car, together with that iconic top secret livery. The Toge events, on the other hand, are not as much fun. The third hotspot, which is called Atami Toge, has, in my opinion, some of the best Toge routes in the game and some iconic opponents like Han and Sham Boswell from Tokyo Drift, and some real life drift legends like Stefan Papadakis, who has built drift cars for multiple champions of Formula Drift, and Reese Millen. But the final location, of which I will not say the name out loud, is the polar opposite of that. Although one of the stages is quite decent, the other one, Route A to be exact, is so incredibly tight and features invisible walls so infuriatingly close to the track that you'll spend most of your time bouncing off the walls instead of, well, actually drifting. The worst part is that you'll be spending most of your time on this exact course doing drift races as basically the entire game only has drift battles, which completely ruined the toge fun for me once I tried to complete this game. And just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, this happened. How did my rival just get so many points? What the hell? Did you catch that? Oh my god, look at... What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? He got like 7,000 points in this... I, I, I'm re-rolling that. Like, there's no way I'm gonna be bothered with trying that again. Like, like, look at the score, man! Yes, what you're seeing here is the AI literally getting over 7,000 points out of thin air. If you're too far ahead, the game literally grants your opponent so many free points that it makes the event borderline impossible to complete. But if you're close to or behind the opponent, it doesn't happen at all. This was probably the final nil in this game's toge coffin for me and made the final event an absolute chore despite the fact that this is where you encounter even more icons from both in and outside of the movies, like Nila, the Drift King himself, and even Kazuya Bai, one of the OGs of the Japanese drift scene, which is honestly just a really cool touch. And as soon as you beat him, and with that probably finish your final race in the game, you simply get a congratulations screen telling you that you've completed the game, and that you should... not perform these actions in real life? <laughs> Why couldn't they tell you that upon startup of the game? Oh well, at least I've completed the game now, right? Nope, because the roll-up races also count towards progression. And how many unique ones are there, you may ask? 40. 40 extra opponents. Yes, there's 40 unique roll-up races to beat, or 32 on PAL, and you'll have to find and beat all of them just to get a true 100% completion of the game. And since they basically appear randomly, all you can do is hope that you'll be able to find all of them. Unless you play on the American version, because for some reason, you can only find 39, which I only found out after grinding the roll-up razor for 4 straight hours! <sighs> alright, alright. I'm not mad. I'm just really, really disappointed. Anyway, back to the review, as despite these annoyances towards the end of the game, I still wouldn't call this game a complete failure. The overall atmosphere, early game fun, car selection and customization easily make up for it. In fact, I would still recommend you give this game a try, but for your own good, just stop playing once you reach the end game of the Toge events. Up until that point, you've experienced practically everything the game has to offer, aside from the LFA which you somehow unlock in the final Toge race. And since the US version can't be completed anyway, it's not even a matter of getting a 100% completion rate. So it's safe to say that this is both a great spiritual successor to Street Racing Syndicate and a well-made Fast and Furious game, and just a decent racing game overall. But what do you think? Perhaps you've played this game before, or maybe you're trying it right now thanks to this video, and what are your thoughts about it? Let me know in the comments or on my Discord server. And if you've enjoyed this video, consider liking it and subscribing. There is plenty of stuff like this to come in the future, and it should only get better from here. And if you want to see even more content, I've recently made a second channel where you can find clips, raw gameplay sections, or just random silly things that I wanted to make. Also, I'll leave a sheet with my emulation settings and a list of songs in the description below. And with that, I would like to thank you for watching, and as always, have a great day.
Oh my god. <laughs> oh, okay, he just died. <laughs>